In this episode, I will consider a suspect who is sometimes put forward by people who inhabit that strange world known as Ripperology. His name is Robert Paul. Some people say, why him? Why not a more well-known suspect? Well, I will be examining the mainstream suspects in future episodes, but I wanted to close off one loose end from the series of films I've been doing about the murder of Marianne or Polly Nichols on Bucks Row in the early hours of the morning of Friday the 31st of August 1888. In an earlier episode of the House of Lechmere, I took a detailed look at Robert Paul as a witness and I recommend you watch this film called Jack the Ripper, I Witnessed a Murder and there'll be a link in the description below. Some claim that Robert Paul should be regarded as a suspect, possibly an even better suspect than Lechmere and it is these claims that I'll be examining in this film. To set the scene, Robert Paul lived on Foster Street Street, which is quite near Bucks Row. Bucks Row is at the end of Sainsbury's, Foster Street ran right the way through the middle of it. Robert Paul gave a newspaper interview and testified at the inquest into the death of Polly Nichols, although the two accounts don't tally up exactly. He said he left home, walked down Bucks Row and saw a man we now know as Charles Lechmere standing near the body. They briefly examined her and then left for work, despite both claiming they thought she might have been raped and so was by any measure in a vulnerable situation. A brief and ambiguous conversation took place around the corner with a PC Misen and they went off down Hanbury Street with Paul leaving Lechmere at the corner of Cobbett's Court. Robert Paul was a carman, a cart delivery driver, the same occupation as Lechmere. At about the same time as they were talking to PC Misen, another policeman, PC Neil, found the body. On his way home from work that Friday evening, Robert Paul gave an interview to a reporter from a big Sunday newspaper called L Lloyd's Weekly News. The reporter was on Bucks Row, no doubt looking for an exclusive, which is what he got. The newspapers that evening presented PC Neil as the first finder, and he also appeared at the first day of the inquest on the Saturday, the day after the murder. In this period, they didn't delay in holding inquests. On his way home from work that Saturday, Paul bumped into the Lloyds reporter again and gave the same account, this time adding that it wasn't Neil who found the body. But besides the earlier ambiguous conversation with Misen, Paul didn't come forward to the police. Lloyds printed Paul's story on the Sunday morning, the 2nd of September, headlined Remarkable Statement. The story detailed how Paul left home and at exactly 3.45 a.m. went up Bucks Row. There, he saw a man standing where the woman was. The man, who was obviously Lechmere, but who wasn't named, came towards him. Paul initially tried to avoid him, but the man told Paul there was a body of a woman over the road. In this story, Paul takes the lead over the body and in the subsequent conversation with PC Misen, who was also not named. In this statement, Paul was critical of PC Misen in particular and the police in general for not having found the body sooner. That evening, Inspector Halson of Bethnal Green Police gave an interview in which, amongst other things, he reiterated the police's belief that PC Neil was the first finder, not anybody else. Indeed, Helson stated that the policemen whose beats were at either end of Bucks Row, one of which was PC Misen, had seen nothing to attract attention. The next day, Monday the 3rd of September, the inquest reconvened. PC Misen appeared and he said that he had been told about an incident by two men who looked like Carmen. They told him he was wanted by another policeman in Bucks Row because a woman was lying there. In other words, according to Misen, they were messengers sent by another officer over a non-life-threatening situation. When Misen arrived at the crime scene, as chance would have it, he indeed found another officer there, PC Neil, who immediately sent him off to get an ambulance, which was at a trolley, uh, to take the body to the mortuary. So Misen and Neil had no opportunity to discuss the matter in detail. The next witness was Charles Lechmere, who appeared under the name Charles Cross. Misen identified him as being one of the men he'd spoken to, but Lechmere's version of the conversation flatly contradicted Misen's. Firstly, he claimed that he didn't mention that Misen was wanted by another policeman. 
Secondly, he claimed that it alerted Meisen to the possibility that the woman was dead and not just lying there. But he didn't claim to have alerted Meisen to their supposed suspicion that she had been raped. Lechmere testified that after leaving Meisen, he and the other man, who he didn't know, went off down Hanbury Street. And he added the detail that they parted company on Cobbett's Court. The dispute between Meisen and Lechmere over what was said in their brief conversation was largely passed over by the coroner without comment. Lechmere clarified that he hadn't said there was a policeman at the crime scene and that was about it. The internal police reports are silent on the matter, as are the inquest press reports. It should be noted that the police were in complete ignorance of Lechmere's testimony when Inspector Helson had given his interview the previous evening. As Helson unambiguously stated that PC Neal had found the body and that neither officer at either end of Bucks Row had seen anyone to attract their attention to arouse suspicion. Robert Paul eventually appeared at the inquest when it reconvened on the 17th of September 1888. By then, the newspapers had somewhat lost interest in the proceedings and reports of his testimony are brief. After all, another murder had been committed, that of Annie Chapman on Hanbury Street on the 8th of September. Robert Paul also had to attend the final day of the inquest on the 22nd of September, after which he gave another interview to Lloyds, which was reported as follows. Mr Paul says that after he made his statement to our representative, which appeared in Lloyds, he was fetched up in the middle of the night by the police and was obliged to lose a day's work the next day, for which he got nothing. He was then summoned to give evidence to the inquest on two different days and had to pay a man five shillings each day to do his work or he would have lost his place. At the close of the inquest he got two shillings, being a shilling for each day. In effect, the police raided Paul's house in the middle of the night and took him away under arrest. Whatever he said must have satisfied them and he was released and appeared at the inquest. Many years later, a young constable attached to Whitechapel's H Division at the time of the Ripper murders, called Walter Dew, wrote his memoirs. Dew went on to have an illustrious career, famously apprehending the notorious wife murderer, Dr Crippin. In his autobiography, unsurprisingly called I Caught Crippin, Dew said, The carman had gone but a short distance when he saw another man on the opposite side of the street whose behaviour was certainly suspicious. The other man seemed to seek to avoid the carman. All this was afterwards told in evidence by the carman. It never had the corroboration of the other man. The police made repeated appeals for him to come forward, but he never did so. Why did the carman remain silent? Was it guilty knowledge that caused him to ignore the appeals of the police? In any other district, in any other circumstances, this would have been a natural inference. But in the East End of London at this time, the man might have had a dozen reasons for avoiding publicity which would have followed. He might have been a criminal, or he might have been afraid. The carman was Lechmere, and the other man was Paul. Fifty years later, Jew's faulty memory told him that Paul was never tracked down, but he remembered that Paul was regarded with suspicion and was the subject of a search. An interesting point to consider is when did the police raid Paul's house? We know from Helson's interview, where he insisted that PC Neal was the first finder, that as late as the evening of the 2nd of September, the police did not believe Paul's newspaper story. It was only Lechmere's attendance at the inquest the next day, the 3rd of September, that confirmed its veracity, so the raid can only have been after this. But would the police have been that bothered to find Paul to the extent that they undertook an extensive search, which was remembered by Dew, just for another witness to confirm Lechmere's account? And how long would that search take? Several days, one must presume. Very soon afterwards, on the 8th of September, Annie Chapman was murdered in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, an address that Lechmere and Paul must have walked past on the morning of the 31st of August 1888, just eight days before. About 100 yards further on from number 29, Lechmere and Paul parted company, with Paul turning into Corbett's Court. Lechmere mentioned this in his inquest testimony.
It seems likely to me that this was the deciding factor that motivated the police to track Paul down. They had already spoken to and cleared Lechmere to their satisfaction, although the extent of this must have been incredibly shallow because the police didn't even discover that his name was Lechmere and not Cross. So in all likelihood, Paul was found sometime after Annie Chapman's murder on the 8th of September, and at least a few days before his appearance at the inquest on the 17th of September. These are the main details of the case as it involved Robert Paul, after which he disappeared from history. You sometimes come across the suggestion that perhaps Paul was working in murderous concert with Lechmere. To some people, the fact that the Whitechapel murders seem to have been carried out so mysteriously in such a heavily populated area implies that there must have been a lookout. In support of this, the attack on Emma Smith on the 4th of April 1888 was carried out by more than one person, or so she said, some doubt has been cast on this as she gave her uh, her account when she was severe, in a severely injured condition but presumably thought that she might recover and may not have wanted to admit about her profession. In any case, the account said three people were involved and not two. When Martha Tabram was murdered on the 8th of August 1888, it seems that two knives were used. At least that was the assumption made by the examining doctor, Killeen, but he was quite inexperienced and may have been wrong. Two knives could, though, suggest two culprits. There were two people involved in an alleged altercation involving Liz Stride, supposedly witnessed by a man called Israel Schwartz, some 15 minutes before her body was found and she was presumably killed. These two are known in Ripper circles as the broad-shouldered man and the pipe man. I've discussed these two in other films and won't go into details here, but again I'll provide a link in the description below. Schwartz's account suggests they were hostile to each other, but perhaps he was confused about what he saw and they were actually working together. It is however very rare for serial killers to work with another person, as it depends upon two homicidal psychopaths getting to know each other and trust each other. Most we know about a couple, such as the case of Mara Hindley and Ian Brady, the Moores murderers. They had been together for two years before committing their first murder. How long could Lechmere have known Paul? Lechmere only moved to Dufton Street in June of that year, and it was only then that their roots would have coincided. That hardly seems long enough for an intense degree of trust to develop. They were both calm and it's true, but there are thousands of calm in London, so it seems scarcely likely that their paths would have crossed before this. The evidence we have suggests that they didn't know each other and probably never knew each other, even though they walked along the similar route. If one was usually five minutes in front of the other and going in the same direction, their paths would never really cross. If they were acting together, why didn't they just walk past PC Misen? Why stop and talk to him at all? Why not just walk past, maybe 20 feet apart? While conducting his beat, Misen was also on knocking up duty, which means he was calling on a list of households that had paid the local police station for the privilege of getting an early morning uh, alarm call, which was him knocking on their door. It seems unlikely he would have paid any attention to the two carmen. Also, Paul implicated Lechmere in his Lloyd story by saying he saw a man standing where the woman was. If they're acting together, why did he do this? And in his testimony, Lechmere mentioned that Paul worked at Cobbett's court. Why would he have enabled the police to track him down? Why did he do that? If they'd been working together, then any bond of trust would have been broken by these uh, events. And yet they supposedly went on to commit at least another four murders together. It makes no sense at all. Could Paul have acted alone? Could he have been the culprit? And could an innocent Lechmere perhaps have unknowingly disturbed him? It sometimes suggested that Paul may have killed Polly Nichols, heard Lechmere approaching and hid only to emerge after Lechmere had passed. It must be remembered that a wide range of indicators show that she was very freshly slain for a maximum of five minutes from when Lechmere first noticed Paul. However, Bucks Row has no hiding places. It was bare arsed. Gates to warehouses were locked. The beat policemen checked this on their rounds. There were no places to hide. I saw one suggestion that Paul could have hidden in a house on Bucks Row to emerge and affect innocence after Lechmere had passed by. Let's run through this. 
Paul would have been in the process of mutilating Polly Nichols when he heard Lechmere turning into Bucks Row. The distance to the corner is 130 yards, but allow, say, 10 yards for Paul becoming aware of his presence. So that leaves 120 yards. Paul must have covered the wounds and then gone silently in the direction of the approaching Lechmere a good 40 yards, but on the south side of the road, whereas Lechmere was on the northern side. Lechmere would have obliviously approached Paul by that same distance of about 40 yards. By now, they would be only about 40 yards apart. The distance, roughly, that Lechmere was to claim to have first noticed Paul, yet in this instance he saw and heard nothing. Paul then tries the door of a house he was next to, and luckily it was open. Paul then silently enters the hallway. What evidence do we have about the locking of front doors? 29 Hanbury Street, in the back garden of which Annie Chapman was murdered on the 8th of September, was kept unlocked, but this was a house in multiple occupation. It was more like a small block of flats or apartments. By contrast, Mary Kelly kept her small single occupancy flat in Miller's Court locked. The room that Liz Stride shared with Michael Kidney was also locked. Fanny Mortimer, who lived on Burner Street a few doors away from where Liz Stride was murdered, stated that she shot the bolts on her front door when she went to bed. All the evidence we have about local dwellings suggests that people lock them up at night, contrary to the cosy myths about doors being left unlocked at all times. So it seems likely that most houses down Bucks Row were locked. A guilty Robert Paul wouldn't know which door might fortuitously be left open and he would be taking an immense risk trusting to luck on such a matter. Anyway, while hiding in the hallway, Paul would have needed to wait for Lechmere to walk past and then emerge, cross the road unseen and unheard, and then walk along the northern pavement in order to seem to have been walking up Bucks Row from behind Lechmere. The theory relies on an innocent Lechmere being utterly oblivious to Paul, initially coming towards him to win 40 or so yards, then after Lechmere passes, he's oblivious to Paul emerging and crossing the road, only becoming aware of him a mere 30 to 40 yards behind him. Remember, a short while later, PC Neil, here's PC Thane, 150 yards away over the same stretch of road, and this theory relies on Paul hearing Lechmere at about 130 yards, but Lechmere not hearing Paul. If Paul had heard Lechmere as he turned into Bucks Row, then he had ample time to disappear westwards past the board school rather than hide in a house. The only reason to hide in a house was to take an unnecessary and gratuitous risk. It's frankly ludicrous, but it's illustrative of the length some people go to in their fanaticism in rejecting the Lechmere theory. The other suggestion is at least slightly more logical, only slightly though. Here, guilty Paul, upon hearing Lechmere, does indeed retreat in a westerly direction, but instead of carrying on, turns left past the board school and then left again into Winthrop Street. Unfortunately, there was a night watchman in Winthrop Street called Patrick Mulshaw, and he testified that he was awake at the time. Nevertheless, Paul gets past Mulshaw unseen and unheard and passes the entrance to the Harrison Barber uh, horse slaughter yard, again unseen and unheard, reached Brady Street, turned left and re-entered Bucks Row. He must have run the whole way and then silently ran up Bucks Row behind Lechmere and then stopped just in time for innocent Lechmere to turn and see him walking calmly and not out of breath towards him. Lechmere covered about 120 yards while Paul covered 385 yards, over three times the distance. Running right around the block would have been his only option. The logistics on the ground alone puts any Paul suspect theory in the nutty column. Thank you for watching so far. There's plenty more to come in this episode, but please remember to hit that subscribe button and comment. Anyway, on with the story. Let's move on. What other points might conceivably make Paul look guilty? Paul delayed coming forward to the authorities. That might seem to be a red flag, but Paul was evidently one of those stock EastEnders who was innately hostile to the police, as shown by his comments to the Lloyd Weekly's newspaper. He certainly was not backward in coming forward as he needlessly inserted himself in the case via the press three times, a strange act for someone intent on engaging in a future career as a stealth serial killer. 
Paul voluntarily came forward to the Lloyd's Weekly newspaper reporter on the evening of the murder and again the next day. He also blabbed to the same newspaper at the conclusion of the inquest into Polly Nichols' death. In contrast, Lechmere only came forward in the aftermath of the publication of Paul's newspaper story which implicated him as standing where the woman was. And so I would suggest Lechmere was pretty much forced to come forward so he could control the narrative. Lechmere was not to know that Inspector Helson would disbelieve Paul's story. In court, Lechmere came across as highly respectful and nondescript, which allowed him to slip back into obscurity for another 125 years. It's clear the police regarded Paul with suspicion for a while, and it's easy to see why. Paul delayed in coming forward to the authorities after the murder of Polly Nichols. Paul expressed his hostility to the police in his press interviews and the next murder, that of Annie Chapman, took place only eight days after the murder of Polly Nichols and it took place at 29 Hanbury Street, which was very close to Paul's workplace at Corbett's Court. All this must have contributed to the police regarding Paul with suspicion. Jew confirms this and we know he was arrested and questioned and as a result, Paul was cleared. So not only was it logistically impossible for Paul to have carried out the murder of Polly Nichols, the police implicitly exonerated him as well. We have overwhelming evidence, which I've covered in previous films, that Lechmere was not put under the microscope at all. The police even failed to discover that his name was Lechmere. By coming forward to the police first, Lechmere was able to allay any suspicions on himself and control the narrative and deflect suspicion onto Paul. Paul was involved in the conversation between P.C. Meisen and Lechmere, and that can be regarded as one of the markers or red flags against Lechmere. So is it also a red flag against Paul? Meisen had to be reminded by the coroner that Paul was even there, and one account has Paul starting off down Hanbury Street while Lechmere was talking with Meisen. Meisen didn't accuse Paul of saying that a policeman wanted him down Bucks Row. He said Lechmere said that to him. So Paul's potential culpability in this instant is significantly of a lesser degree than that of Lechmere. Paul was barely, if at all, involved in the conversation with Meisen. Paul was a local man with local knowledge, and the best guess is that the culprit must have been in that situation. But all of Paul's known connections are with Bethnal Green, away from the crime scenes. He obviously walked past Polly Nichols and Annie Chapman murder sites, and his workplace was relatively close to Mary Kelly's crime scene. But there was nothing to draw him to the Liz Stride, Martha Tabram, or Alice McKenzie crime scenes, unlike Lechmere, and nothing to link him to any of the torsos. So in terms of geography, he rates rather poorly in comparison to Lechmere. I've mentioned several times in other films that the renowned Jack the Ripper author Philip Sugden suggested that Lechmere and Robert Paul acted callously by deserting the body of Polly Nichols when they both supposedly were uncertain as to whether or not she was dead and thought she'd been raped. I'm inclined to agree with this assessment and have suggested that Lechmere's callousness was an indicator of his guilt. So equally, couldn't it also be seen as an indicator of Paul's guilt? However, there are three factors which might explain Paul's callousness. Firstly, we know that Paul had a hostile attitude to the police. This might not be regarded as an attractive trait, but it is nevertheless an explanation. Lechmere, by contrast, appears to be overtly obsequious at the inquest, humbly yes sir, no sirring the coroner. The coroner, did you see Police Constable Neil in Bucks Row? The witness, no sir. I saw no one after leaving home, except the man that overtook me, the constable in Baker's Row, and the deceased. There was nobody in Buck's Row when we left. The coroner. Did the other man tell you who he was? The witness. No, sir. He merely said that he would have fetched a policeman, but he was behind time. I was behind time myself. I believe Lechmere deliberately acted this way to deflect any hint of guilt. But if he was innocent, it doesn't explain Lechmere's callousness. Secondly, Paul's daughter was born on 20th of September, while the inquest was still underway, and only three days after Paul testified, and two days before the final day of the inquest, which Paul also had to attend. On the morning 
of Polly Nichols' murder, Paul's wife must have been heavily pregnant. This may have heightened Paul's reluctance to get involved. Thirdly, in his initial newspaper interview, Paul stated that he left Polly Nichols because he was obliged to be punctual at work. When Lechmere appeared at the inquest the next day, under questioning from the coroner, he corroborated that Paul told him that he was behind time, uncannily echoing Paul's comment in the remarkable statement. Almost as an afterthought, Lechmere claimed that he was behind time as well, as if he was borrowing Paul's excuse. On the subject of their callousness, about 50 yards after Lechmere and Paul left the body, they passed the entrance to the Great Eastern Railway Yard, which was being guarded by PC81 GER. This was a Great Eastern Railway policeman. It was his job to guard the gate to the stop intruders. PC81 GER said he saw and heard nothing that morning. Perhaps when Lechmere and Paul passed, he was slightly away from the gate. Maybe he was somewhat inside the entrance and so didn't see them. Perhaps he had nipped off for a toilet break, or perhaps he was having a sneaky fag in, inside somewhere. Perhaps he was checking the boundary wall inside, who knows. Lechmere had presumably been walking that route to work since he moved to Doveton Street in the June of that year. How long had Paul been working at Cobbett's Court? He had been a carman since 1879 and had been living at Foster Street since at least 1881. It seems likely that Paul had been walking down Bucks Row on his way to work for a considerable length of time. Had neither Lechmere nor Paul previously noticed PC81 GER before? It beggars belief that they were totally unaware that there was a policeman on duty just 50 yards from where they had found the body. Just as they must have both been aware that there was a policeman at the gate of the Great Eastern Railway Yard, surely they must have known that there was a local beat policeman on duty nearby who was actually PC John Neal and he must have been somewhere nearby on one of the side turnings and must have been coming along quite soon they must have known that but neither made the slightest effort to find him if one of them was guilty they would have known his direction of travel and known that he would appear very soon from one of those turnings at any moment if one of them was guilty it was important that they left the scene quite quickly. A speedy departure was required. No wonder Lechmere refused to help Paul prop the body up, whereas Paul was fussing around the body, pulling the dress down and making a general nuisance of himself as if he had all the time in the world. With Paul, we can see why he might be reluctant to report the matter with his evident hostility to the police, being distracted by the imminent birth of his next child and claiming he needs to be punctual for work. There was less excuse for Lechmere. Now let's take a closer look at Robert Paul. Who was he? Robert Paul was born in Bethnal Green in 1856, a district where most of his family were rooted. His father was involved in the clothing industry as a dyer. In 1871, the whole family, Robert with six brothers, sisters and both parents, his sister-in-law and two nieces were living at 4 Wellington Street, which is now Cypress Street. They occupied the entire house, which implies they were of the prosperous working class. For aficionados of the case, this is where Joseph Fleming, an erstwhile boyfriend of Mary Kelly, lived at number 60 Wellington Street, which was right at the other end, actually. He was three years younger than Robert Paul. Robert Paul married in 1879 in St Jude's Church in Bethnal Green, which was the ch same church where Lechmere's mother conducted her second bigamous marriage. This was seven years before in 1872. In strange circumstances, which I detailed in a previous film, for which I'll provide a, a link below. We can see that Robert Paul clearly wasn't very proficient at writing, and he was a carman, a trade he stayed in all his life. By the time of the 1881 census, Robert Paul was living at 30 Foster Street with his new family. His firstborn son was also given the name Robert Paul, but he died in 1884 as an infant before his fourth birthday. He went on to have another son also called Robert Paul. In this, Robert Paul was strangely similar to Charles Lechmere, whose first son was called Charles Allen Lechmere, and he died young, and he went on to have another son who he also called Charles Allen Lechmere. One of his daughters, Margaret, was born on the 20th of September 1888, 
just before the last day of Polly Nichols' inquest. His children seem to have been brought up as Roman Catholics. They attended a Catholic school and were baptised at St Anne's Roman Catholic Church on Underwood Road, which is in Spitalfields. In the 1891 census, the family can be found on the other side of Whitechapel Road uh, on Sydney Street. His wife died in 1905 and he remarried in 1916, understating his age by three years for some reason, probably vanity, but he was listed as a cart minder, so presumably driving a cart was too hard work for him by now. But he was still able to father a new child with his new wife in 1911, which was actually before they got married. I briefly corresponded with a lady who said she was the granddaughter of Robert Paul, born in 1951, to that daughter born in 1911 and it would be very interesting if she got back in touch again. A small amount of reflection renders the Paul suspect theory to naught. Indeed it has only ever been proposed by ardent Lechmere theory deniers as a supposedly clever retort, which it isn't. Robert Paul cannot have appeared behind Lechmere on Bucks Row if he'd been disturbed by Lechmere appearing in Bucks Row. Paul made a nuisance of himself, repeatedly running to the press, whereas Lechmere receded into the woodwork. Paul was cleared by the police, unlike Lechmere. Paul had an excuse for his callous behaviour. Lechmere did not. Paul was barely, if at all, involved in the disputed conversation with Meisen, unlike Lechmere. The geography of Paul's life doesn't fit the overall pattern of offending, unlike Lechmere. You might wonder why I've even bothered to debunk the Robert Paul counter-suspect theory, but it perfectly illustrates the idiocy one encounters in this field and accurately reflects the standard of debate in what is known as ripperology. It also shows that you cannot make a case against anyone, and not everyone who lived in the East End can be linked to all the crime scenes. Believe it or not, these claims are sometimes made. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, share, ring that notification bell, and of course comment with your thoughts. And until next time, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.